Once more, I want to thank Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Now, Raycon earbuds such as their latest model, the Everyday E25 lineup, are top-of-the-line Bluetooth wireless earbuds that not only start at about half the price as other premium wireless earbuds on the market, they also sound just as good and are backed by a number of celebrities and music connoisseurs like Snoop Dogg, Cardi B, Brandy, Melissa Etheridge, just to name a few. They come in a variety of colors to help you match your preferred aesthetic, and their sleek, compact design fits incredibly well in the ears, giving you a great noise-isolating fit. They last about six hours on a single charge, but you can also charge the carrying case itself to give you more hours of playtime while on the go. But as of late, as I mentioned before, I've actually been using them in the comfort of my own home because of the pandemic and such, uh, listening to music and podcasts while I'm doing yoga, trying to lose weight and making my spine scream. And I recently bought a second pair because my brother likes to take my original set when I'm not looking. We can both agree that they're great for shutting out the rest of the world though. And you can save 15% off your order today by following the link in the description below buyraycon.com slash some call me Johnny. Pick yourself up a pair today or two and please do take care of yourselves. And now on with the show. I don't know if I'm ready to head back into this one. I haven't touched this game since that original SGB review way back in 2009. 11 years, I think my time away from Sonic Chronicles is the only thing that comes close. <sighs> uh, maybe some of you might remember this, uh, if you've been following this channel since the late 2000s, but when this initially came out, I fucking hated this game. I recall making a, a small update video. This is before I wrote the SGB review and all that, and I claimed it was one of the worst Sonic games I'd ever played, worse than 06. It left such a nasty first impression on me. You know, back then this was cool when you were a, like an edgy bitch lord, and I accentuated my negative opinion to help get my point across. But that was then though, 11 years is a long time. I still have memories of the things I didn't like back then, but I feel it's still important to look at the game again with a more mature state of mind. The second game of the storybook series, the last game of the storybook series, let's take a look at Sonic and the Black Knight. This game was announced during a very confusing time for Sonic the Hedgehog. After Sonic 06 happened, the next year Sonic and the Secret Rings was released, placing Sonic in the Arabian Nights. Then Sonic Chronicles was revealed Sonic's first RPG that was new grounds for the dude. Then Sonic Unleashed was soon announced afterwards where Sonic transformed into the Werehog and that was a thing to process. And then shortly after that we're told about Sonic and the Black Knight, where Sonic is placed an Arthurian legend rocking a sword and I was like, what is happening? happening to Sonic. I always like to give new Sonic games a fair shot, but this was one I had mixed feelings for before I even put the disc inside the console. To me, it felt like Sega was honestly throwing darts at a dartboard, trying everything and seeing what sticks. And this one certainly didn't. After this game was released, the storybook series was scrapped as Sonic and the Black Knight didn't do well critically, and financially it did all right, but it didn't sell as well as Secret Rings. Afterwards, Sega started doing that damage control I mentioned in the Colors video, and Black Knight, among a few other games, drifted away into the Forgotten Realm. Unless you're Sonic Unleashed, then maybe you can download it off PS Now or Xbox Game Pass, I don't know. But over the course of the decade, much like a few other games around this time, opinions on Sonic and the Black Knight started to shift. Nowadays, you're likely to see more people think a little more positively about the game. I could say that's because the only people actually playing the game nowadays are those that liked it from the start and those that didn't have long since moved on and viewpoints are skewed, but that's the asshole thing to say. Either way, I'm willing to go back to see if there was something I missed. Why not? And let's get the obvious stuff out of the way first. Regardless of what I have to say about the actual game itself, I can't knock the game's looks and soundtrack. Even back then, I thought Black Knight had amazing visuals for the Nintendo Wii. Much like Secret Ring, Sonic and the Black Knight takes a more unique approach in storytelling visuals, and I think it works. I love this game's art style, the way everything sort of breathes in this presentation, emphasizing dark shadows, making the primary colors pop as a result. Reminds me of the art style of Majora's Mask looking back. I believe this was also the last game to use the four kids cast. The last time we hear Amy Pallant as Tails, Dan Green as Knuckles, Lisa Ortiz as Amy, and the last time we hear Jason Griffith as both Sonic and Shadow. Hey, uh, ended on a high note, I think. They all came a long way from their Sonic X days. The passing years truly did wonders enhancing their performances. But all that aside, why did they go so hard on this soundtrack? Huh, damn, this game has amazing music. And some of the best vocal tracks in the whole series, and I don't mean that as hyperbole. Night of the Wind, Through the Fire, Fight the Night, and Live Life are some of Crush 40's best work, complementing the gameplay and scenario incredibly well. 
pumps me up every time I hear them. Although I admit that Night of the Wind did annoy me at first. You hear those opening chords like three times before you even start playing the fucking game when you select the game in the menu. When the opening FMV plays. And during the title screen, you hear Johnny Gialelli go all That shit was repetitive. But I did warm up to it once I heard the rest of the song, and oh man, the final boss music with me performed by all ends, so fucking good. One of my favorite boss themes in the series. Seriously, there's so much effort placed in this soundtrack, and I don't mean to sound like I'm underselling the stage themes, no, they're quite good too. Jun Sano made his proper return to Sonic after taking some time off after Shadow the Hedgehog, and he brought back that classic adventure style with his trusty guitar along with a decent mix of Celtic. Richard Jocks also had a hand in the soundtrack, just don't go remixing it, he might make us think about it. I'm a firm believer that a great soundtrack can help carry a game or story if the latter two don't quite meet expectations. I mean, I don't have much to say about the plot itself, but that moment when Sonic gets up from his ass kicking near the end and starts playing It Doesn't Matter from Sonic Adventure 1, mm, Mm, that was delicious. The story, uh, we should cover that real quick. The next chapter in this two chapter Sonic storybook series begins with this magical wizard in peril running from this menacing black knight and his dark forces. Using an incantation very similar to the one Eraser Jin used to summon the satanic Ifrit and secret rings, the girl summons Sonic to enlist his aid, make of that what you will. Quick to assess the situation, Sonic wharfs down one of his patented chili dogs and makes very quick work of the Black Knight's goons, but before he can make his next attack, he's quickly pulled away from the action as the girl makes a hasty retreat. The girl is introduced as Merlina, granddaughter of the great wizard Merlin. Yes, Sonic has found himself in Arthurian legend this go around. He should really keep those damn books of his on lockdown if this is going to be a recurrent thing, though I would have liked to see the series continue if it eventually meant getting Sonic in the dystopia in 1984. Anywho, Merlina explains that the Black Knight is in fact the fabled king King Arthur himself that has been corrupted by the power of his scabbard, making him a tyrant, making him immortal, and he's using his legion and round table to oppress the commoners. Merlina asks Sonic for his assistance, and never one to say no, even if he doesn't have much choice given the circumstances, Sonic agrees to help. However, to even stand a chance, Sonic needs to acquire the power of this ancient sword Caliburn and prove his worth as a knight so that he can easily vanquish the dark forces, something he's already proven he can do without the sword, but I'll stop being a dick now. Of course, the sword itself is sentient because Sonic always needs a sidekick for these sort of adventures, and he's quick to run down the blue guy in his disorderly behavior, but the two eventually warm up to each other thanks to the real superpower of teamwork, and after some chivalry here and there, whipping the asses of the round table for which there are only three in this game for some reason, Shadow, Knuckles, and Blaze, Sonic is ready to fight the knight, and then Sonic wins, and that's the end. But no, not really. For as soon as King Arthur is defeated, Merlina takes the scabbard for herself and uses its power to begin creating a new world that would last forever. Merlina has a real bad case of thanatophobia. It's hinted at once early on, coming off as pretty random then, so it's like, all right, what was that about? But that's the focus of the final 30 minutes of the game. Merlina's grown depressed and somewhat nihilistic, realizing that her world is fated to go to shit, and she's willing to use any means necessary if it means keeping things the way they are. And Sonic's all like, hey, hey, death comes comes for us all at the end. It's about what you make of your life that counts. Now stop trying to kill yourself, Knuckles, because holy shit, that almost actually happened. Sonic taps into the power of Caliburn, inheriting the gold armor from Super Ghouls and Ghosts. God forbid if he gets hit once. And after some waggling, Merlina is defeated and later reflects on the errors of her ways. I'm sorry, uh, this is a story that started with us dealing with a corrupted King Arthur and his court and it ends with a therapy session for Melina and her fear of death. I mean, the themes are good. I think the writing is not that bad, actually. I think it's a good blend of lighthearted fun and seriousness and is rather confident in its delivery. But there are two different stories here that don't mix well at all, and it shifts in tone so hard by the end of it. Better than Secret Rings, most definitely. Hell, one of the better stories of the latter half of the decade it was released. Really though, I didn't want to come back to this game to see what I thought about the story, even if it was better than I remembered it being. Uh, grab your Wiimote and nunchuck because it's time to start swinging. I guess I should mention that the only couple of things I didn't spend much time on was ranking and battle mode. Ranking mode should be obvious. You play stages with certain objectives and upload your best times and scores to the leaderboard, but the Nintendo Wi-Fi has long since shut down. This mode is essentially defunct. Kind of depressing, but that's the day and age we live in now. Battle mode is multiplayer action. Very basic multiplayer action, where you and three other friends can play a variety of modes available. I think you unlock more as you complete more side quests in the main game, but of what's immediately available, you can smack each other silly with weapons, collect more rings than the other before time runs out, or you can fight a giant soldier for total dominance. I couldn't really experience this mode fully because I had no one to play with, and I'd rather not have company over in the middle of this pandemic. Still, just from what I got with two Wiimotes plugged in, these are small distractions, not much 
much better than the party mode in Secret Rings, or Sonic Shuffle for that matter. They lack in what I consider to be truly engaging multiplayer action. I mean, look at Blaze here. Not even she can give a flying fuck about the multiplayer, poor thing. Okay, Sonic is not another mythical tail rocking a sword this time. Remember, he said he wouldn't be caught dead using guns, but swords are fair game, technicalities. Sonic and the Black Knight continues the structure of Secret Rings with two major alterations. The first being the sword play, obviously, and the second and perhaps best change is that Sonic does not automatically move this time, and the nunchuck is actually used this go around too, giving you a more comfortable control scheme. Oh my god, thank you. Now despite being able to move forward and back with more east, you're still on rail strangely, and I don't fully understand this. My guess is that it was probably kept this way to keep things more focused so that certain set pieces and level design could have more presence. In some ways, you can look at this as a super fast paced hack and slash or beat em up, but I think the better choice would be to give us more freedom in movement so that it's more of a super fast Legend of Zelda. Ooh, I like just thinking about that. It's good that you have more control, but now this puts more emphasis on the other design quirks from Secret Ring structure, namely the fact that you can't really turn around or move backwards without seeing where the hell you're going. Now, for the most part, this isn't that big of a deal since Sonic and the Black Knight heavily encourages breaking through every line of defense with all your might and blaze on by. It's when the game expects you to stop to either interact with an object like these treasure chests or these light beacons, or when you can interact with villagers and offer them money by playing these quick time events. Do you want the money or not? I ain't got time for these games, come on. Simply put, just doesn't feel good to slow down and get in a better position. You're only able to move in cardinal directions, moving backwards without looking back. It's like a more restricted Crash Bandicoot if I can compare it to something. Sonic is still quick on his feet and can get around lickety split, dashing on the ground, climbing up walls and grinding on rails. His homing attack though has been made next to worthless. I don't even know if it's capable of destroying enemies, you just harmlessly bounce off of them most of the time. It's more of a tool to close the gap and air dash across large chasms and that way it's fine. Until it gets a little herky jerk as homing attacks are known to do, but I know this was all done on purpose to give the sword play more prominence. It's all about the Wiimo in this game, and with a wiggle left or right or up or down, it doesn't give a fuck, Sonic can swing that sword and chain attacks together with continuous waggles. You don't need to make large, room encompassing swings, don't be like Reckless Silhouette Guy. Simple wrist flicks are enough to register an attack until it's suddenly not, and then you find yourself doing more wrist flicks than previously just to get something to happen. This is assuming you're even doing basic swings and not doing something more useful like the circular homing buzzsaw thing. So okay, the homing attack wasn't neutered, it just transcended. I'm serious, if you jump, try and do the homing attack and then swing the remote as you're closing in, Sonic will do this flying buzzsaw strike that fucking demolishes everything in the way. It doesn't always work, it can feel downright imprecise trying to pull it off, and I think some enemies are immune to it, but with it, you don't even have to try. It became my basic means of attack because just swinging the sword regularly felt so unresponsive. Even when the game has no problem registering my flicks, the swings themselves look and feel sluggish, and in terms of combo potential and finesse, you know, Sonic rocks that sword, but he ain't no Dante or Bayonetta. And I know it's probably not fair to compare this game to those, but when I'm using weapons, I want to be fulfilled, I want to be engaged so that I can look forward to my next encounter. This sword play doesn't really accomplish that, the QTE is even more so. Fucking hell, I lost count at the amount of times I failed these reaction prompts against the other knights when I'm trying to finish off the Black Knight, the timing is either super strict or the game just doesn't register my command altogether. I'd rather just block attacks and use regular ass sword swings. It's slower but gets me results. The Soul Surge is the one thing I will defend though. This is the game's equivalent to that whole time and speed break mechanic from Secret Rings. You fill up this gauge and then by holding down the B button and swinging down, when it decides to work anyway, Sonic rushes up to the next available foe where you can then time a devastating swing in bullet time. Hit it just right, you kill the Foe, fill the gauge back up some, you rush the next enemy, lather, rinse, repeat. Like I said, it can be frustrating to start it up because of unresponsiveness on the ground or in the air, but when it gets going, it does legitimately feel decent to use, and it can be used to bypass certain obstacles altogether if you know where to activate it. I love using the grounded variety on the Black Knight. I know you're supposed to use the air version of Soul Surge to catch up to him, but using the ground version suddenly puts the game into hyperdrive. Now that horse there is getting a serious fucking workout. The sword play in Sonic and the Black Knight is functional enough. In fact, let me just say now that I think Black Knight is the better of the two storybook games. Giving you more control of your actions is a major step forward for me, like I really mean that. Even if we are still on rails, the core gameplay could be a lot more fleshed out, but what's here gets the job done, for as much as that means, because the job doesn't ask for much and at times feels rather rushed. For instance, late in the game you can not only pick Sonic, but you can also choose between Shadow, Knuckles, and Blaze. I know it's technically Lancelot, Gawain, and Percival, but 
It's Shadow Knuckles and Blaze, breaking the illusion and you can't stop me. They all behave relatively the same and you can even choose between different fighting styles to make them more of what you prefer. Something with more power, more speed, or something more balanced. And the more you use them, the more proficient you become, which I think unlocks more skills to waggle with, I don't know. I don't like Shadow's airstrike because of how he stops dead in his tracks in midair, breaking the flow, but I love that his soul surge is chaos control. He just fucking zip through the stage, that's great. Knuckles can glide through the air as he always does and that alone makes him fantastic because I can just fly over all these enemies and not swing the Wiimote a single time. Yeah, I get a shit ranking, but I'm not playing this game again after this. Blaze, uh, man, I wanted to like Blaze more. She's one of my favorite characters in the series, but here, her sword play is clunky, her aerial game is downright pathetic and cumbersome, like she has a double jump and midair lunge and is still somehow the worst in platforming. I tried playing the volcano stage with her, but after around eight to nine deaths, I said, oh fuck this, I'm switching back to Knuckles. Yeah, well, there are better games with her, but okay, multiple characters, awesome. More reason to play the game, but it's only for like three, four stages only? You can't even go back to previous stages and replay them with the other characters, which seems like such an obvious thing to include. There are additional side missions in previous levels, but imagine the replayability the game would have if you can go in as Shadow or Knuckles. Gotta give folks a reason to keep coming back, and I don't think Black Knight does enough, which also makes other elements feel unneeded. Whenever you finish a stage, you can spend points to identify these items. For a good chunk of the main adventure, most of these don't even mean anything, and I was so confused. I see the potions, tomes, necklaces, and lollipops that give slightly noticeable buffs to ring chains and status effects, but the gauntlets, the spears, the minerals, the food items, what's going on with these? I'm collecting so many and I have no idea what they're for. That is until you unlock the crafting system, which allows you to make more weapons with those items you obtained. Okay, first off, needed this system introduced way earlier than it was. Making that more obvious from the get-go would give players more incentive to engage in more enemies, helping civilians and complete more side missions. But because it is introduced so late, it is so underutilized. You're almost done the game when it's unlocked, I'm not kidding. Not counting side missions, this game barely clocks in over three hours. And after the credits ran, I was done with the game, didn't feel the need to go back. You can always go back and get better ranks, maybe make some new source to help accelerate that, but it feels all extra and afterthought. This is a more streamlined adventure altogether and it cut down a lot of fluff that plagued Secret Rings. The content in of itself is better. Stages are filled with gorgeous design and set pieces accompanied with fantastic music. They can feel a little homogenous at times and I like to think the on rails nature is to blame for that, you know. Being unable to really explore these locales kind of damages the appeal and though horribly limited, having access to Shadow Knuckles and Blades in some regard is nice for those who enjoy their presence here. But I'm saying all this without mentioning the biggest thing on why I don't like this game. While an improvement in almost every sense compared to Secret Rings, physically, it's exhausting. Using the Wiimote as the sword makes sense, I get that. But whether you're doing basic combos, singular swings, the soul surge, or using that jumping buzzsaw thing, this game asks that you move that damn remote a lot, too much in fact, and it's worse when the game doesn't register your swings at all, because then you have to overcompensate. Even with simple wrist flicks, which I state is what I've been doing this whole time, I started to get a little cramp, the same type of cramp I get when I'm trying to play Metroid Prime Hunters, Kid Icarus Uprising. I don't like feeling that, but the sword play is everything in this game, and there are no alternatives, no different control schemes, none of that. If you don't like motion controls, even if it makes sense thematically, you better stay the hell away from this game, I can tell you now. I can respect the presentation and sound design to the cows come home, but as a game, nah, I don't need to come back to this anymore. My opinion on it has softened from previously because nowadays I think I can appreciate when a game tries to do something a little different, but the end result is what matters the most in Sonic and the Black Knight, while superior to Secret Rings, is still a pretty mediocre Sonic game. Listen to the soundtrack, watch the cutscenes on YouTube or some other service, but you don't need to play this. I feel there's nothing to gain from it. You know, the idea is solid. But if they were to try something like this again, they need to flesh out the combat mechanics, make the level design more expansive, take us off of the rails, and give us more controller options. I don't know if we'll ever see another attempt at something like this again, but I'm just saying the idea can work, and I certainly wouldn't mind another attempt. Yeah, but that's all the time I have for today. I'll see you guys in the next video. As always, thank you all for watching. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask when you go out. Have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.